Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. I'm a... I'm getting by fine. I've, I've got my antibodies now. I'm, I'm all immunized and such. I haven't been able to run for a week now, which which kind of sucks. I, um, I have these chronic weird problems with my feet, and I've been putting off getting them treated for a few months now until I'm post-vaccine. And they they kind of disturb the whole chain of my body in ways that I don't realize. So running or even just the day-to-day -day of life is going to cause potential long-term problems. I've got an appointment with my podiatrist on Monday, uh, so maybe after that I'll be able to get back to it and, and uh, straighten my brain out and body and all that stuff. Uh, work, meanwhile, remains heavy in ways that I can't talk about publicly because of NDAs and discretion and all that stuff. I will say that with everything horrible that's going on in India right now with the COVID uh situation and the variance and the huge proliferation of cases. It has taken all of my strength not to reply on Twitter when people make ill-informed comments about patents and vaccine manufacturing and all that stuff. Um, anyway, I won't get into it here either. It's just I've been in this space for over 20 years. It's much more complicated than you think. The one, um, the one thing I've been happy about uh, you know, I mean, I don't have an unhappy life, but the thing that weirdly is making me really happy is that I'm still drawing every day. It's still just trees. Um, and I am starting to get worried about what I'm going to do once the leaves come in and I can't focus on, on the intricacies of branches and I have to figure out how to handle color and the kind of uh, uh, ambivalence of leaves and such. But... um a funny thing happened. I noticed last week after the fact, because I was somewhat um, uh, troubled beforehand, that when I was drawing, I didn't think of anything that was bothering me. I didn't let it sneak in and start, you know, tweaking my brain and stuff. Like when I'm running, I still have all those things because it's repetitive and I'm doing all these calculations in my head. And then I start to get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, et cetera. But with drawing, even when it's not going well, I don't think about other stuff. And I don't, when it's not going well, I don't take that as an opportunity to beat myself up and start, you know, using that as an illustration of how I've screwed up everything else in my life, which I know I haven't, but blah, blah, blah. Um, I just keep going. And, and it's weird to have discovered that. And I was kind of worried that the discovery itself was going to ruin it going forward, that I would start thinking about not thinking about that and, and then blah, blah, blah. But but no, um, every time I sit there, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, imminent things like the wind blowing my hair all over the goddamn place and how I have to keep it back and, and you know, all this. But but I don't think about the big stuff or all the pernicious little stuff when I'm drawing. And it's a weird to make that discovery at 50 that you can have something like that, that gives you its own, its own zone, but you know, better late than never. I hope you've got something like that in your life. Um, or that you're not as cursed as I am to be constantly self-analyzing. Um, Anyway, speaking of art, self-analysis, and every goddamn thing else, my guest this week is someone I've wanted to record with for years now, um, and you'll get that reference to analysis and everything else shortly. Uh, she is the great cartoonist Sherry Flanagan. New York Review Comics has just published Trots and Bonnie, a collection of Sherry's amazing comics from the 70s and 80s in National Lampoon magazine. This book is is fantastic. And not just for, for bringing back these classic strips. It's beautifully designed, has a great foreword by Emily Flake, a neat interview with Sherry by the book's designer, Norman Hathaway, 
And it's got a section where Sherry annotates every one of the strips that's in the collection. The whole package is is just amazing. It's a hardcover. It, it's just, God, it, it's an amazing book. Um, now, as I, I mentioned in the conversation, I discovered Sherry's Trots and Bonnie comics when I was reading National Lampoon at a little too young of an age. Um, the magazine had my warped sense of humor down to a T, uh, both in the, the prose pieces and the comics, but... But as a pubescent male, I was also checking out the the sexy photos and the ads in the back of the issues and, you know, um, material. I'll put it that way. So Trots and Bonnie, whose lead characters are a 13, 14 year old girl and her talking dog. It was like a look in a, a funhouse mirror, almost like reflecting back the sensibilities of a, a girl going through her version of the same phase that I was going through, um, but carrying a lot more significance and weight because of all of the expectations on girls. And and it's weird, but just like seeing that a quote unquote girl could have some of the same tumultuous stuff going on in her head was, was weirdly revelatory for me now that I, I really think about it. Now, Trots and Bonnie goes way beyond just, you know, a uh, case study of a girl in puberty. It had amazing social and, and political conscience, hysterical humor. I mean, it is a funny, funny strip and a ton of subversive, um, well, I want to say messages, but but it's not that. Um, more like questioning. Like through the, the comic, Sherry explored a ton of assumptions about American life in that era and blew up a lot of them as hypocritical inheritances of, of well, darker times, I guess. Um, it, again, it's these, these comics are fantastic. And, and what's even better about this, this new collection is how gorgeous the artwork is. The craft of Sherry's line work is is just amazing, and it's it's not something I'd have appreciated as a kid reading her work. But to be fair, the magazine also wasn't you know doing a great job with printing, so so a lot of the nuances of her line work were lost in translation. All of that makes the new Trots and Bonnie collection an absolute treasure. Um, if you read those comics in the 70s and 80s, you will enjoy the heck out of this new edition. And if you've never seen Sherry's work before, you are in for a treat. Now, I've gotten away from giving caveats about specific episodes, but I do have one to share this time. Um, a, I was excited to record with her. B, because we recorded a little later in the day than I usually do, I had an afternoon coffee right before we started, so I was kind of jacked up and much gabbier than usual. Sherry was into it. Um, we had a great post-episode conversation for like an hour or so. I feel like I've 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 made a friend through this, um, but I do concede that I talked more this time than usual. Sorry. Now here's Sherry's bio from the Trots and Bonnie collection. Sherry Flanagan is a cartoonist, writer, and editor. Her work has appeared in a variety of books and magazines, including The American Bystander, Graphic Classics, and Drunk, Stoned, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. After living and working in San Francisco, Los Angeles, the Florida Keys, and New York, she now resides where she grew up, in the Magnolia neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. Sherry holds degrees in commercial art, computer technology, web design, and professional technical education and instructional design. She loves post-apocalyptic science fiction, the artist Charles M. Russell, and walking her dog. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Sherry Flanagan. The first thing I just... You know, about Trots and Bonnie, about the book, I hadn't seen these strips since I was reading them in the 1980s. And and I was reading them as a different person when I was a, a teen, early teen. Um, now, just seeing these reproductions, I am in awe of of your line work and, and just how gorgeous the art is. What was it like for you? sort of looking back at that work and, and seeing your artistic development and your, your storytelling development over the course of about 18 or 19 years worth of, of strips. 
Yeah, well, it started in 1972. So, and actually, the, I was the, a year the, old. The comic, <laughs> sorry, the comic strip. Yeah. <laughs> and you were reading it then. <laughs> I was precocious, but <laughs> it started, you know, when I was still working in comics in in the San Francisco underground comic scene. So, uh, it was even earlier than seventy two. Um, I, but for the book, I pulled out all my strips, which had been in this trunk in the basement. And I had to go through every single one. I had to like find out which ones I had. And then, you know, I had to get the size of them even just to, you know, be able to work with them physically. And I, I was reading my strips again. And some of them, I forgot that I had done them yeah. and I was <laughs> laughing at them. So it's my humor. So I'm, so gratified that other people share that because there are a lot of people who like when I was growing up, there were a lot of people who didn't get my humor. So um, it's, it's makes me feel a little more normal to, to know that um, people enjoy it. Um, oh, go on. Sorry. No, like you, I'm thinking you asked me about seeing how your art progressed, you know, uh, how you changed. Cause I could see some of the, the earlier ones, they're scratchier, you know, if, if you put it in that, that term, and, and your line becomes so fluid relatively quickly, you know, did you see that sort of progress or do you remember like any sort of artistic it's, I don't uh, say breakthroughs, but it is muscles in your yeah. hand. You actually develop the muscles in your hand. And I can look at people who try to draw my characters and they look like what I was drawing when I first started. It's you don't get the proportions right and you don't get those little, you know, those pen lines. A lot of the line has to do with um, using a Hunts 101 fleur de lis point hmm. and a dip pen. And uh, because of the fleur de lis, it holds it holds the ink better and you get that line that's thin to thick. So that's that has a lot to do with the look of the strip. Um, but. Yeah, I think I think mostly I just got better at drawing and more relaxed when I was drawing. It's like when you're swimming, you do it better when you're relaxed. And I did have some help. I had a lot of advice from people. There's a wonderful artist named Charles Vess, um, oh, who was in, he's been in yeah. New York for a long time. And he was originally from this sort of artist community in Richmond, Virginia. And he said to me one time, he said, you know, you don't need to do all that cross hatching." You can just make it black and white and it's going to look good. And I loved his art and I loved the, the art that he was looking at. So um, that I changed what I was doing a lot after he made that comment. So it's little things like that input that you get from other artists, I think, make a difference. Yeah. How much of a, an, a, a comics community did you have? I mean, I know you're, you were among the Air Pirates. Wikipedia has you as the, uh, the only member not to be sued. Uh, for, for the Disney parent. <laughs> the only member who is going like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah, that might not be the smartest of moves, guys. <laughs> I don't get this. <laughs> well, but, but how much of that, that sense of community matter? Like when you were, you were growing as a cartoonist, how much did having other, other cartoonists to critique and uh, to critique their work, you know, those sort of guys, picture? those guys were, I mean, we were an art studio. We were teaching other people how to do that work. There were a lot of people who were in and out of that studio where we were working. We had a little place originally that was like two rooms and we all slept there. One crazy bathroom that we were sharing with a lot of other businesses and people were in and out of that. And then we moved into the Zoetrope warehouse in, this is in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was enormous. And there were lots of people who would come and go. And we were trying to create a community, um, a more political, politically oriented community than some of the other artists that were working at that time in San Francisco, you know, specifically, you know, like anti-corporate and stuff like that. Definitely anti-war. Um, so I... But these guys, uh, Bobby London, Dan O'Neill, Gary Halgren, Ted Richards, taught me so much about my craft and each kind of different specific things. And, and simple stuff like never put more than 10 words in a word balloon. 
because it's too much to read. And then also um, not to use contractions too much. Uh, it's, be, and again, just that's to make it readable. O'Neill was really good with that stuff. I mean, as well as he's a great storyteller. And uh, they taught me how to end a comic strip to put an end on it because I would, I did this one strip at the time and I was kind of practicing. It wasn't Trots and Bonnie. It was another thing um, about an African explorer. And, um, and it just went on and on and on. And I had all these pages and I'm going like, I don't know how to end this. And um, I think it was, it might've been Larry Todd, who also is a really good cartoonist from that time and was, was with us at that time. Uh, they sat me down and they said, imagine that you're writing a movie. Imagine that you're watching a movie. How is the movie going to end? Mm -hmm. And that was so helpful because there's something, you know, in these comic strips, they're really a, sort of a mini uh, stage play or a mini movie. You know this. Um, and and once you once you perceive it in that format that it's just another story and your character or whatever is going to ride off into the sunset or you get a f the, yeah. this is written really well in the book the sense of an ending which is mm. there's the Enough. book the sense of an ending there's the novel the sense of an, en yeah, there, there's an ending a novel, and there's the but, movie but... the sense of an ending <laughs> but the original book is actually talking about how people how storytelling is the way that we've been transferring information for eons, you know, since the dawn of man and that we've developed this need to have resolution in our storytelling, to have meaning and resolution. And once you sort of think about that, you'll see it everywhere. It's really cool. So that's, that was one of the things that I did only learned the sense of an ending fairly recently, but originally there were these guys telling me how to end a comic strip. I'll say I've read the novel, but not the original, um, not the the uh, the critical piece that shares the same title from 50 I, years earlier. But I think you would love it. I, I figure, you know, you're reminding me of when I first recorded with Roz Chast and we were talking about the memoir she did about her parents growing old and dying and how she was stuck in the middle of it and couldn't figure out how to make the whole thing work. And it was her therapist who gave her the advice. Have you thought about chapters? And she yeah. literally is like, I, it didn't even occur to me that you could break a law because she'd never really worked in long form stuff before. And once she got that, it was like, oh, yes, chapters and episodic development is how stories are told. Why didn't I think of this when I was in the middle of it? And then the whole thing cracked and she was able to to, to make the work. But but yeah, when you're inside something, I imagine it can be difficult figuring out if, yeah, without somebody just saying to you, you need to do this and, and just open it up. Um, I can imagine that's, uh, that's tough, figuring out how to tell a story. And therapists are such good editors. It's, it's <laughs> so worth been, the I've, price. I've never, I've never been in <laughs> therapy. I've been told I need it, but I've never been in therapy. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've long believed that, you know, they would have a, Gil, these are the obvious things you've been doing repeatedly in your life. Here's the story you've been telling yourself. Stop doing it. <laughs> They don't tell you to stop. Oh, oh good. Okay. Well, that way, I have look they forward. tell you you're okay because you've been doing it. <laughs> I figured the way I put it, and and it, partly it's because of the the low rent artist artistic people in my life. Me paralyzed by anxiety and depression is still higher functioning than like ninety percent of my artistic friends on their best day. So you know, I figure I'm getting by. You know, I'm just luckily didn't pursue a career in the arts, at which point it all would have gone downhill. But you know, this isn't about me, though. <laughs> no, you're you're like a, a major um, positive energy kind of person, which is the kind of person I really like. And and so what you're doing is you're going like here. I have all this anxiety and and that kind of energy, and you and you you channel it into the kind you need to do what you want to do. I tell I tell people who think I'm really smooth and comfortable in these conversations, every single week I am racked with anxiety about the guest and how yeah. we're going to talk. Even if, even if it's someone I've recorded with before, it's it's easier, but there's always the holy crap, I've got to, you know, and and you know, I've 
getting to to watch a couple of your interviews, I realized, oh, she's easy to talk to. This will be fun. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> and again, I, I loved your work since I was a little too young. In fact, that's a question I have. How many people like credit and or blame you for for warping their minds at a young age? Do, do you? Get much uh, uh, comment like that because I'm um, one of those people. Some of them are already warped, and so they really <laughs> they like it. <laughs> it reinforces their warpedness. <laughs> I'll tell you, I mean, just revisiting Trots and Bonnie, like again, I discovered it eleven, twelve years old. So I'm getting your early '80s strips into the the mid '80s. Hormonal pubescent teenage boy. And seeing your rendition of of a girl in you know that that opposite you know world, but same frame of mind, it was weirdly revelatory at a time that you're reading these magazines looking for the dirty ads in the back and you know the boobs and all that stuff, and then you're getting trots trots and Bonnie in the middle of that it's again it's something that I would say warped, maybe for the better, I guess, <laughs> but, you know, definitely changed, you know, my development and my, my understanding of other people and what's going through their brains too. So, so thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was going through my strips looking for ones for some reason, I think maybe for uh, videos or something that, that I could uh, make a slideshow of that wouldn't be too controversial. <laughs> yeah. And I realized that most of them are not like that. Um, but I think, um, well, you know, I, my hope is that uh, I was continuing to hold people's attention, you know, because maybe something, maybe they'd all take off their clothes or something. <laughs> and uh, but there was there's a lot of information about psychology and birth control and, um, you know, yeah, politics. You yeah, know, you, you get yeah. a political perspective in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was, and I was pushing it. <laughs> it did, did you? Find, I know you mentioned how your editors, your editor pushed for uh, more sex, less politics. But in general, did you find, did you find controversy came more from from politics or sex, or did you not get into too much trouble given that it was National Lampoon overall? So. They had a super hands off policy on hmm. all those. It, all the comics. And it was like, here's, you know, we're going to do this subject, you know, can, can you come up with a story? And it was like, they told you what was going on and you did it. And well, th these are in the longer stories that were in the book. Yeah. And then the funny pages, it was totally hands off. I mean, nobody, I heard that um, in, with Playboy, like Hefner himself would look at all the comics yeah, and yeah. make decisions on them or I theoretically, I guess, have people change what they were doing, which is OK for him um, because he was a cartoonist, you know, and he wasn't he wasn't like a we'll ask the secretaries if she thinks it's funny, you know, <laughs> which is I have heard that before. We passed it around among the secretaries. Uh, <laughs> so. So, yeah, I mean, there was no the only the only thing was the copy editor and the copy editor editor used to drive me crazy because she was usually right. And they, <laughs> they go in, they don't even tell you about it. They just go in and change the dialogue and do a paste over on the art to make you look smarter. <laughs> like you Which, can spell. I go like, I can spell. I'm a good speller. And she goes, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. No, for a cartoonist, I'm pretty good. Yeah. That's, <laughs> well, we couldn't look things up on Google. Yeah. That, that's always to me. And again, I was born in 71, so I'm pre-internet. And that's getting weirder and weirder dealing with, with younger people who just don't grasp that there was a world without this and without cell phones and everything else. It's, it's getting stranger and stranger, like trying to convey that like an alien planet to, to someone. But, you know, we're I think old. it's OK. It's OK, though. It's it's good. It's the future. I mean, it's the way things should evolve yeah. is uh, hopefully. I mean, I'm not like a back to the land kind of person. I always thought that was a really kind of oppressive mm -hmm. way of approaching Oh, I'm not ideal. championing it. I'm glad we can do. I'm glad we can do what we're doing right now. As a matter of fact, you know, none yeah. of this stuff would happen. But you know, it's still just the sheer weirdness of of you know the alien world we we grew up in. Do you ever think about how your your art would have developed if you were well, if you were their age now, if you were 25 or or you know coming up as a an artist? Well, there are a couple of things. One is. Yeah. 
One is that when I was doing that work, it was filtered. I mean, to be published was extremely special. And because not many people got there, it was the music industry was the same thing. And it's like, look at how the music industry has changed now that you can become a star because you posted yourself playing guitar on YouTube. And so that's the big difference that I'm seeing is like when I was doing that stuff, I thought, well, I'm saying something important, you know, and I've got this like big audience once I was in Lampoon. And, and, and you feel the sort of weight of the responsibility of what you're saying. And, um, it also is like, you just, you have kind of a sense of power when you're doing it. It's not my primary focus, but, um, there, there is that you're feeling like you're doing something worthwhile. Now it's like everybody's talking everywhere and their opinions are out everywhere. And it's, it's, it's just, it's literally marvelous yeah. um, it, that people are are allowed to do that. And, and, and I think we're in this really weird transitional stage of that where, you know, people are, are saying things and then it's like, oops, you know, <laughs> and it's going to be there forever and I'm going to get fired in 20 years from what I'm doing for what I do here now. Um, so... And that's that sense of responsibility, you know, when you when you put your opinion out there. And that's that's really what I was doing. And it's weird now um, to be so much so many decades later from when I started and look back at what my opinions were back then. And, and sometimes it's it's not fun, actually. I mean, yeah, there, what, there's a couple of see? strips I left out of the book that um would be really not misunderstood, but just within the, the context of today or, or just, you know, it was fine back then when I'm going like, well, what if, you know, what if Idi Amin was, you know, uh, in in high school now and, and taking over the high school and <laughs> killing, <laughs> killing all his constituents, you know? So, and that just, you know, that was... I was allowed to explore questions and, and themes like that, but it, they're totally like, nobody's going to get that in the context of today. It's just going to look really bad. Was it more the out of date stuff? Because I think like when they did uh, Bloom County, when, when he started recollecting or collecting those in big hardcovers back in, gosh, it was whenever Borders was going out of business because I bought a bunch of, of, those collections at half price from a borders. Um, mm. there were all these annotations, you know, like, uh, the, this is who Tip O'Neill was and, and, you know, these, these yeah. little side bits, but, you know, <laughs> is it more that stuff or are there things that are, uh, we'll say problematic given the, the era that we, we live in at this point? Are there strips that you were like, yeah, this would get me into hot water if, well, if we, I we just it. we discussed it i mean it wasn't just me it was i mean i had the final word i guess but um originally um i i went through all my strips and then i rated them in an excel file according <laughs> yeah. to how how much like the num the fives really had to get in there and the ones were absolutely not and then mm. there were a lot of in between ones and almost all of those cuz i didn't know how many pages were going to be allowed in the book so i had to have my priorities straight so and and almost everything when is in the book and on top of that i did what i have always wanted to do there've been a lot of people asking me to do a collection for a long time and i always wanted to annotate oh, what, i love that part of the book what i was thinking yeah and it's, uh, it's wonderful seeing your your comments you know page by page with this stuff but well, i'm sorry i'm interrupting so. no no thanks yeah. uh, and and michael gerber um who publishes american bystander just let me take um eight pages of outtakes um, that that didn't run in the book, and then also write about them. So I really enjoy discussing yeah. where it was coming from. Yeah, how tough was it? Uh, I mean, so many of them include recollections from that that annotation section. Recollections of not just this is what was going on, but this is what I was thinking. You know, how, oh, how yeah. easy is that for you to to evoke? You know, do, do those strips bring a lot back to you uh, along oh, those yeah. lines? 
Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I remember what I was thinking when I was 13. I remember what I was thinking when I was like four. I Listen, think. I'm trying to forget what I was thinking when I was 13, but that's okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> I know, I know. Again, you, you, you spend a lifetime in therapy and I've, I've managed to hide from myself all these years. <laughs> well, I was, I was miserable when I was 13 and I, my, I had problems with my parents from, really starting well earlier than that my family and yeah. but but kids in school and i just retaliated in in print those strips are all about the kids that i went to school with and and a lot of bullying and and stuff that went on and and my parents all, most of the stuff in that comic strip is true is like <laughs> verbatim <laughs> my mom telling me about getting a period. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried, I described the, we were taking a walk at the time and I, I described to my wife, the uh, mom having the birds and the bees conversation with Bonnie and you know, the, how the whole thing is structured and then the punchline and then the second punchline. And, you know, she was dying, but you know, I, I was disappointed to see in the annotations it never exactly happened that way, but still, it should have. That's that's what. Counts. Yeah, that no, they never they never told me at all about the birds and the bees. They never told yeah. me at all about sex. No, my yeah. mother said, "Don't grow up too fast." That was that was her <laughs> her code. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, she me. she stunted yeah. her plants too. She would like <laughs> not water the plants on purpose because she didn't want them to become too large. Oh, man. Your, your therapist must have just had a field day. That's it's not even a metaphor. This is great. Yeah, that's that's. Well, they let uh, you go. They get they let you go twice a week if you're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you, and I guess this ties into the same question as a therapist, but really, it's about the the National Lampoon time. You mentioned that you know the the gatekeeper aspect and and you know what it meant really to be published. Do you remember that sense of holy crap? I have an audience. Like there's, there are people who are reading my strip every month. You know, did, did you, is it something, again, like nowadays you get that sort of instant feedback, like we were talking about where people, you post something and people are commenting or liking or whatever right away. But did you, you know, remember a, a time where it was the, yeah, people actually read Trots and Bonnie. Yeah, and it, well, my name. it was in, incremental for me because I started out, I was in art school and I, I want to say rioting in the streets. I was demonstrating in the streets and um, doing things that I guess they shoot you for now. Um, and I, so I, and I, I hooked up with these people who were, who were going to start this newspaper here in Seattle. And uh, so they let me, first they let me paint their window, the sign on their window that, that we're now a business a newspaper. And then they let me do, illustrations and they let me do covers and, and all kinds of stuff. And it was great because I was learning, I was using the stuff I had learned in art school. So the first, and, and they pay you in papers, you know, so here I was in my little neighborhood in Seattle called Magnolia. It's a little kind of sub suburb in city suburb because there's tennis courts and lots of parks and things. Mm -hmm. And I was walking around with this newspaper going like, learn how to kill your parents. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you could sell it for, you know, a nickel or something. I did not do well here, but the stuff was in print. So as soon as my stuff was in print, it was that feeling that you're describing. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was, it was just sort of a rolling rolling, it's hard to call it a career, but it was like what I did. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, what was important to me was feeling validated, feeling like um, what I was thinking was validated because other, because it got into print. So that happened originally very early on. And then when I was in Lampoon, there was a, when I got into Lampoon, there was like a lot of controversy in the underground about selling out Mm -hmm. um, and working for the quote overground media. Yeah. Um, so my feeling wasn't, Oh, wow. Isn't this great? It was like, I'm going to do this <laughs> yeah. and I don't care what you think I'm going to do this. And I like these people, you know, that I was working with that lampoon. And it was always fun. I mean, it was like 
it was just like hanging out with your friends. I mean, it was kind of my whole career has been like hanging out with your friends and doing <laughs> cartoons, you know, and, and then they get into print and there's not, you know, there's a three month lag in Lampoon from the time you turn it in till the time you'll see it in print. So it smooths out the experience, the working experience to, yeah, you know, I, you I just, can imagine you, that instead of yeah. the immediate thing. Yeah. 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 So I hope yeah, that I, answers your question. Oh, it does. It's it's that it's a longstanding thing I wonder about with artists, that sense of knowing that you have an audience and then what that knowledge does to the work, you know, whether it affects what you're trying to do or whether you say, fuck the audience, I'm going to make, you know, what I want and, and put it out there. Yeah, because you know this. You, when you do a craft or, or something like that or your job, you're involved in the minutia of it. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you're caring about your tools, you know, and you're caring about, you know, if you have things or you care about whether you have an idea. And if you have the idea, you know, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to lay that out? How are you going to make it something that is real? And then, like, for me, I would be like, I would like, I'd spend about a day getting my comic strip together. And then I would spend like a week figuring out the punchline and going around <laughs> to people and going like, here's the strip. What's, what's a way to end it? <laughs> more, more often than not, you figure it out. You do credit people in those annotations again with, thank God he told me, you know, what the punchline was and boom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people I owe, I owe largely for yeah. helping me I, out there. I can imagine. Now there's, um, f within National Lampoon, you also ended up serving as an editor there for a while, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you feel qualified to do that? And is it something <laughs> that you, you enjoyed doing at the time or was it a, I'm learning that I don't like doing this, but I'm, I'm learning, you know, what was it like, I guess? Well, I, I, fortunately I was hired by PJ O'Rourke, who also did not go to Harvard. Mm. I'm pretty sure he didn't. A rarity um, for them, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and and I got hired at a point when um, there there was a lot of turnover, and my previous friends like Doug Kenny and that was Michael Michael O'Donoghue was still in New York, but Doug Kenny, a lot of them had moved to California to make movies, and um, and PJ was pretty much the new editor in chief, and um, bless his heart for what he brought to the magazine then it was refreshing and it was different and uh he just gave me carte blanche and and i um i got to uh you know find a lot of people to to introduce a lot of people and i got to uh promote the magazine um i did a little um little buttons and little marketing hmm. things. And I just enjoyed the whole, the whole way that an, as an editor, it, it broadened your scope of things that you could do. And I started writing uh, prose pieces and becoming more confident about that too. And God, I got to do all this great. <laughs> I got to, you know, get my friends to take their clothes off and draw on their bodies <laughs> with Sharpies and stuff. <laughs> it was like, it was like a real candy store. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad we're not doing this in person then. Okay. <laughs> well, I was wondering why you wanted me to be nude, but you know. I, I have used that joke again and again with this. So, like People say things like, oh, I forgot we were even recording. I'm like, yes. And they don't even know that we're naked right now. <laughs> Thank you for being the person. That, it's the first time a guest has made that joke. That's awesome. <laughs> Now, I recall from the um, well, Mimi Pond had mentioned that, like, you were the reason she came to New York, you know, because of the National Lampoon role. So, uh, you know, I, I love seeing the lineages, like the, the, the connections that are made, like all the different ways, you know, this artist connects with this person and this is, you know, how this group comes together. So, you know. It sounds like you were a good facilitator, you know, and, and for me, schmoozing is my mutant superpower. So I like people who, you know, help bring other people together. So. Yeah. And the Lampoon, like if I took somebody out to lunch, the Lampoon paid for it. <laughs> Even better. So there's a lot of lunching. <laughs> Bob Eckstein, a New Yorker cartoonist. Um, 
the, a bunch of the New Yorker gag cartoonists get together for lunches in Chinatown yeah. in New York City. And he just, Gil, you've got to come in and you've got to, uh, you know, come into lunch with us. It'll be great. I've told him, you know, he thinks I'm funny from our, our conversations and from the podcast, but I really feel like lunch with a bunch of, of humor people, I will be the unfunny guy. But no, you know. no, no. They've been they've been doing that for a long time. They console each other by yeah. by, by meetings. <laughs> I'm I'm imagining that's there's a lot of there's probably a lot of complaining about money uh with cartoonists when they get together. They they're yeah. they're not they're not because you gotta understand, you know. I mean, if you're in the humor business, like people who compete, like try to get the last word, you know, yeah. they love a straight man. Yeah. Um, I'm not funny. And I always like when I teach kids, I was teaching middle school kids like for decades. And uh, and I tell them, you know, don't get stoned, don't get drunk. Just, you know, go to parties. And um, so because you have to, you know, you're going to be meeting people. And uh, but you, but you don't. I mean, people liked me because I didn't say anything at Lampoon. <laughs> I, I, I just sat and I had a little notebook and I wrote down everything they said in the notebook. I drew their picture and wrote their yeah. <laughs> what they were saying. So, you know, that it's you, being funny is the last thing you want to do. So I've, I've learned that. That's my advice to you. <laughs> Much appreciate. This is great. This is my therapy. This is a fantastic <laughs> session. I, I, I hope we don't cut it at 50 minutes. I hope we get to keep going. But, but you know, it's actually that question, you know, when we talk about like the, the, the connections and the lineages and all that, do you, do you see yourself in the sort of the continuum, uh, like with the air pirates, with the undergrounds and all that, you know, do you, do you see what you've done over the course of your cartooning career, like, you know, in its place in terms of, of, you know, sort of the history and the development of, of the form. Well, like, I mean, I, I guess that. Yeah. I don't mean it. Nay, do you see yourself in a historical lineage, you know, legacy well, legend kind of way, but you know, I mean, there, there are people, people who are writing books about it, have written books about it. There's documentaries. i Little small parts in a few documentaries. Uh, and, oh, I got to uh, see Comic Book Confidential for the first time a few months ago, so I was happy to see your segment in it. So yeah, yeah, there, there, there are a few of those. So, so I guess you know I get to be in there. I'll tell you, it's not really my, um, it's not an ego thing for me. Sure. Uh, probably more of an ego thing for me than for, you know, say when I was working in a hardware store or something, there was like no ego there, but um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's okay. My hobby is thinking and yeah. I think a lot about stuff. And, and if you happen to wake up with me in the morning and I drink coffee and start talking, it will become really obnoxious. <laughs> apparently because <laughs> it's just fun you know it's fun to think about stuff so that's where i'm at you know like dogs live in the moment too you know they're not really concerned with the past and and certainly not their future which is usually not too good and it's just like the moment you know sniff the flowers and do that that's pretty much i think how i live i'm not yeah. i'm not concerned with a place in history mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had no idea when, like I recorded with Paul Mavridis a bunch of years ago during a business trip. I was out in San Francisco and there was that that sense where he was like, yeah, I'm kind of this bridge, I guess, in the underground era. But, you know, there wasn't really time to think about that. You were just making work with Gilbert Shelton and, you know, doing this, right. that and the other. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. I you, guess, you, that sense of looking back at where you were. I think, I mean... Which is the thing is good because people like you are recording something, and so other people are writing books and and whatever. And it's important that they do that because I know this because it's important for me to look at what other cartoonists were doing in the past. Hmm. And, and that what, raises what the they, question with with this collection: a, how happy are you with with you know? the book itself, because I've, I've seen you with the actual print thing and B, you know, are you hearing from people who are discovering your work? 
now? I know the book's just coming out, but it's been sent to cartoonists <laughs> who, who uh, yeah, there's a quote from Leanna Fink who did not know your work and is now, oh my God, where has this been all my life? You yeah. know, that, that sort of thing. She um, is so good. Have you interviewed yeah. her? No, we shared a cab at a festival once and um, we talked about recording at some point and it just kept, well, uh, I just kept not following up and then the pandemic hit and now I've got to actually, you know, push that once we're all vaccinated and, and sit down with her. I discovered her on Instagram. Her in yeah. animations are amazing. So I am really hoping that she ends up directing a movie, directing it. I say that like, you know. Marjan, uh, Marjan Satrapi doing Persep <laughs> Persepolis, you know, and really having her hand in it because, because Leanne, I think, is like a major, major talent. Yeah, she's yeah. really got the, she's got the, you know, the cool cartoonists, I think, the, the artists, artists, what they do for the world is they make you see it differently. M.K. Brown, like once oh, you read enough gosh. of M.K. Brown, yeah. you will start seeing people differently. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Picasso, you know, all these people, like, like abstract artists, everything. And and Leanna Fink is one of the people who will make you start seeing the world differently and, yeah. and inspire you as well. And she works yeah. on the iPad Pro, which is like what I've started doing. And it's major, major life-changing work. I was going to ask, what's your drawing? A, what are you working on nowadays? B, what's your, your drawing practice and, and technique? What do you do? Well, there's what I used to do, which always yeah. involves, you know, a great big, huge drawing board and big pieces of paper and ink and water and pencils. And I have a little, a little uh, book, um, book plate that I've done in, in lieu of, you know, signing books for bookstores. And it, oh, geez, there's my sister calling me. Um, <laughs> Who hates her? Well, I know you'll, you'll yeah. gripe about your parents, um, I'm sure. <laughs> so I, I have all my tools, little teeny tools on this book plate. It's almost everything I've ever used. But now I don't need any of them because I'm working on the iPad Pro with a little Apple Pencil. And it's basically everything I need. And um, this this um, um, software, Procreate. Yeah. Oh, no. Bridget Mooring would no. love to talk to Shane. Go away. Go away. <laughs> Okay. I have the little do not disturb on my watch. I always turn that on yeah. before we start. But I know other people have, you know. Uh, you know no, it wasn't family. my sister. It was one of my neighbors. <laughs> She's okay. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, so yeah, the iPad Pro and Procreate, the $10 app yeah. that is better than Photoshop. Yeah. And you find it... Um, some artists, you know, uh, oh, to flash back to Mimi Pond, it connects me to, to when I talked to her husband, Wayne White, and he just went on about the need to, like, be physically engaged with the work. That, that drawing on a, a digital surface just didn't carry what he called the the stink. Um, but other artists have told me that's all BS. You know, we, we want to be able to make the work however we can. And, uh, you know, working digital is just fine. Well, I, I couldn't do it um, yeah. before this. I because I, what happened? Okay, so what happened is that printing changed. Yeah. So when I started out with the the comics that you know that you're looking at in the book, um, what happened was I I would send my work to New York, like sometimes on a Greyhound bus, <laughs> package it up, mail it, UPS, whatever. And then the photo, the, there would be a, they would photograph the art and make a plate out of, make four plates because it's the four color process. And then from those plates that were, that were burned from a, a photograph of the art, um, that's, that's what printed the, the work. Now it's all digital. So now it all becomes pixels and, um, so I would do like really g work that I want to say good looking. I would do this good looking work and then I would scan it and it would be less good looking and then I would tweak it and it would be even less good looking and then I would turn it in and it would be even less good looking. 
and because it had the little, you know, the little jaggies and things yeah. like that. And I've, I've learned a lot about the printing process now having to do with the digitization of mm -hmm. the artwork. So, I mean, if Wayne White does paintings, I don't think he really has to worry about selling his painting. But if Wayne White does, you know, a painting and then it's photographed, I mean, it's, it's, it's digitized, it's scanned, then he is subject to the same grief that everyone else is, you know, with, with the outcome. So, um, the, the iPad Pro gives me a level of control that I've never been able to get by, you know, using a pen and a, and a, and an external, you know, drawing surface. A tablet. And that raises the raises the question: What are you working on? You're, you're, um, you're drawing, so that I'm, means you have to talk I'm, about what you're drawing. <laughs> I am doing. I am doing a um, a five page comic about uh, the environment. It's um, for a book that Joyce Farmer's doing. Oh wow! And yeah, uh, yeah she's putting it together, and a lot of people are in it, and. Um, it's supposed to be funny. So with, that's a nice, you know, it's, it's always good when you try to be funny about what's happening to the environment and global warming. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cheery subjects. <laughs> it's a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> so she, mm -hmm. but she's pulling it together. She's a harsh editor. And, uh, so, um, that's working out. And, um, let's see, what am I doing right now? I'm making videos, uh, for bookstore presentations of, of my comics. And so I'm doing an audio track, um, in, uh, in the, uh, Adobe Aud audition. And yeah. I, I that's love what I'll be editing this episode in that. That's what I do. My, my podcast editing and output from. So you know, I'll you're be calling company. you up, asking you how to fix things. <laughs> it's all self-taught for me, but it's, you know, it's one of those things where I figured out an awful lot. I started with GarageBand, moved to Logic Pro, and then I was, um, I was asking uh, uh, the producer of a really big podcast, how do you get that audio quality with such small file sizes? And he explained the settings. I'm like, those settings don't exist in logic. He's like, Oh, we, we use Adobe audition. At which point I thought, eh, let me figure it out. And yeah, since then it's become the, uh, the go-to, but, but yes, I will, I will offer tech support as best I can. Super. <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be emailing you with, with my questions then. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Again, schmoozing. That, that's what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, again, the lack of a book tour, how has your pandemic year been? Is it something you're okay with talking about? Has it been on a par with normal people's? Uh, have you had difficult time oh. or an easier time? Because cartoonists <laughs> tend to find it rewarding not to have to go anywhere or see anybody. <laughs> yes, I'm in my cave. It's yeah. it's kind of difficult at this stage now not being able to go reach out to people and and si do signings and go mm -hmm. to con co go to conventions. So I'm missing that. And I hope that, you know, in the future, we'll all be able to get back into doing that. And I'll be able to get on a plane and go somewhere. And uh, so I've been vaccinated twice. So I'm Yay. feeling good about that. I, I never got sick. And I, and I really didn't get sick because I really didn't be around people and shake anybody's hands or even use very many public doorknobs. So, uh, and yeah, it's, it's been good. It was weird at first though, you know, when you were like ordering your groceries and stuff, yeah. that was, that was and that's scary. When we, were, we were worried about the, the surface transmission too, before we realized it was all air. So we would have the groceries down in the garage for two days right. before bringing them right. in. And now it's like, okay, it was the best advice at the time. <laughs> we didn't know any better, you know, now, now we're a little better with this stuff, but, but yeah, it was. It was strange, but, but yeah, most cartoonists I've, I've recorded with, you know, they're, um, they basically say, you know, this is my day-to-day -day life anyway. So <laughs> I, I wasn't leaving the house much. I was bent over a, a, you know, drawing table and, you know, I just, the rest of the world ended around us, but I just kept drawing is how most of them have described it. But yeah. yeah. Life is, life is better when, when the weather is good too, because you can always go outside and do things. I've, I've seen more people in Magnolia Park, where I live, it's a big park. There are not all that many people in it, but now I'm seeing people 
it'll be 40 degrees out there and they will be like wearing their bathing suits, getting some sun, <laughs> laying in the sun. <laughs> We're starved. You know, we all yeah. just want to get out and, and you know, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's been rough. Yeah. But it's but it's tell, lovely. Oh, yeah, it's it, especially with spring now. It's seventy degrees right. here in New Jersey, so it's you know, uh, it's today is National Independent Bookstore Day. I went forty minutes away to my closest bookstore and just seeing people walking around in shorts and t-shirts and masks, but still, you know, yeah. out and about was kind of. Kind of nice, but I was wondering about uh, you. You live in Seattle. Do you, do you live in the house you pretty much grew up in, or have you moved? I remember oh, reading that's, that. That's it. <laughs> yes, I'm okay. Here. I live in the house. Trust me, I live in the house I grew up in. I've been here my entire life almost. So uh, <laughs> you and I are two of the stranger people either of us will ever meet with um, paid for houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I finished yeah. paying off my dad's second mortgage, and now it's like, well, I'm just gonna stay here in northern New Jersey in this house that is an extension of my nervous system but um but can you can you talk a little about a the neighborhood seattle and the pacific northwest you've, you've lived a few other places including living in new york when you were doing national lampoon do you see an influence i guess in the place where you live and in in what that area means to you you mean in in reference to my work I guess, yeah. I, specifically, I, I guess with the, the book. It, my the work is thing. my work is yeah. all about my neighborhood. I mean, if I yeah. if I have the characters in a school, it is the junior high school that I went to yeah. that is the same and has not been remodeled. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I show it's my, in I show my wife. We, we drive by, and I show her this is this is where I went. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> she, she gets really tired of this after 15 years, but, you know, it, it's okay. everybody <laughs> does that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Landmarks, the landmarks of our childhood. I had a, a boyfriend who did that, who took me on a tour of Kent, Washington. <laughs> like, here's our old house and here's our other old house. <laughs> and this is pretty much it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, there isn't a whole lot in Ringwood, New Jersey to show off either. But, you know, I, I've, I've done my best. Wait a minute. Overkill. It's not, you didn't say Ringwood, did you? Yes. R-I-N-G. There is a Ridgewood about 15 minutes away, but I'm in Ringwood. Um, is that a thing that you That's know about? That's a great name for a town. Well, what's funny is all these years, it never occurred to me until I was corresponding with Jim Woodring, who I consider one of the, the great cartoonists of, of all time, that he thought, Woodring? Ringwood? This is weird, Gil. I'm like, yeah. I have <laughs> not thought of that ever. And that's why you're a genius. And I'm just yeah. some schlub from New Jersey. But, you know, that's, that's yeah, Ringwood. It's named after a uh, British town. We have this weird very weird history going back to the Revolutionary War, and uh, there's all sorts of of stuff about this this town and 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 the iron mining we used to do here. And we, like I was here, I'm first generation American, so I'm I'm I don't have great roots, but you know this is the only place I've I've ever lived extensively in my uh, my days. But but yes, Ringwood, that's a uh, that's, yeah. that's place. Someday we'll get you out here. If you come to New York, we'll we'll take you 25 miles away, and you'll see, and then drive away in a panic. Uh, you know, a bomb no, I love place. I love New Jersey. New Jersey yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. This is all woods. I I recently and nobody is going to listen to this part, but I recently took up drawing at 50, um, which I'd never done before. But all I draw are the trees around me because. That's all I see. I get up in the morning and it's just trees everywhere. And I thought, if I were gonna start drawing, I would I would draw the tree. Nobody else has drawn these trees. Let me sit down and figure out how to draw trees. And since then, over the last three or four months, it's at least every day I, I sit down and try and get a tree in. Oh, um, good for you. That it's hard to draw trees. Apparently, I picked the wrongest thing in the world to start with. I couldn't figure out bark to save my life. And eventually, it, it was looking at some comics by Seth where I realized, oh, he just does two wavy lines. That's all. <laughs> that, 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 that's the bark. That's all you need. You know, it's it's despite a lifetime with comics, it's literally only been like the last couple of months of, of actually drawing something that I, I it's just changed my brain. Like you were talking about at the very beginning with the the reps and, you know, getting used to the, the nib you were working with and all that, that just I'm like, oh, I've sort of known this all these years, but it's only now that my hand has been connected to a pencil and a piece of paper that I get, you know, just the slightest bit of, of what goes into what you do. So, Do you, you know about the Betty Edwards book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain? 
No, no. I, I've been afraid to like study anything about drawing as opposed to just drawing a tree every day because I'm convinced I'll either get much better or I'll get too self-conscious and anxiety laden and screw well, everything she, up. <laughs> she's, she's, she basically talks about that. I mean, she says she's talking about the hemispheres of the brain yeah. and how most people are working on the, um, the editor side of, you know, most people deal with the, the critical side of mm -hmm. their brain. And it's, it's to, uh, use it. What she does is she teaches or she did teach drawing to corporate groups. So she actually made a living doing it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, um, but she said that it, it changes the way you think to exercise yeah. the part of your, your brain that draws. So this is totally appropriate for you to be doing that. Yeah, it, it, it hit me. Thank you. Um, on the drive home from the bookstore today, because I stopped in a park and drew a tree there. And I thought on the drive home, I'm like, I don't think about work or anything. Even if the drawing's not going well and I'm a little pissed off about it, it doesn't bring in all the other things that piss me off in my life. I'm like, when mm -hmm. I'm just drawing a tree, I'm actually not thinking of all that stuff. I should do this more often so I can <laughs> escape the hell that is my life. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> the question I, I was wondering about, usually I talk about cartooning influences with people, but I was wondering, especially since you've, you've worked on, on prose uh, in addition to, to comics, sort of about your, your literary and reading influences, you know, who, what authors meant a lot to you when you were younger, you know, who you're reading nowadays are the things that you, I don't want to say emulate, but influence the way you, you write. I read a lot and I have always read a lot. It was like, you know, I just did under the covers of the flashlight kind of person yeah. and always ahead of, in fact, I, I haven't read a lot of classics. Um, I don't know why. I, I like I like sort of I don't know popular fiction. Um, Contemporary is a good way to put it. That's that's. I guess yeah, but except that I was reading contemporary fiction like in nineteen fifty, maybe nineteen sixty. Um, so it's not, yeah. not our contemporary right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, like Lady Chatterley's lover is required reading for you when you're 14, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I read, I had a lot of, because my sister, well, my, my living sister is eight years older than me. And then I had a sister that died before I was born who would have been, I think, 15 years older than me. And my Ooh. family never throws anything away. So all these books have been handed down. So I read all the, all the uh, children's books that you were, people were reading that it was like pre Dr. Seuss. Um, so I was reading the Bobsy Twins and Nancy Drew and um, Marguerite Henry's horse books and uh, things things like that. And the, the Black Stallion, um, which became a movie. Um, so so that's what I was reading when I was really young, plus some Superman comics and that hmm. that type of thing. And, um, my father, my father found me reading a mad magazine and immediately tore it up. That was about <laughs> as far as I got then. And then when I was a young teenager, I think I, well, I, I spent a lot of time in the library. I read some, there was a time when everybody was looking at religious movies and, and reading religious books like, um, the search for the Holy Grail and things like that. That was yeah. so, so my reading when I was, when I was really young was kind of it, what it, what it, what it uh, instilled in me was this sort of weird sense of right and wrong and how to be a good person. Mm -hmm. If, if that makes sense to you, like it, it sort of instilled my sense of good and evil. Um, just, just from reading these kind of old fashioned, you know, how you should live in the thirties books. <laughs> and, um, and, and then I, and then I started reading the books that my mother had hidden in her underwear drawer. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Butterfield eight was one of those, <laughs> um, which became a movie with Elizabeth Taylor that was pretty good and giant Edna Ferber. Um, the books about China. So, so all those, you know, and it's like, I, I remember them. I loved all those books. And then I started in the seventies, 
the seventies, people were reading those long novels, like the Thorn Birds and stuff that got that got made yeah, into like series. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they were they were yeah they were all sort of and uh, there were a lot of those and they were just juicy stories that went on forever, which was good because they were good and you didn't want them to end. And uh, and I think I had more time to read then, and um. So, and I'm just, these are just things off the top of my head. Recently, I was thinking about books that I read, um, I think in the 80s, that had an effect on me. Ring Alivio is is one of those. Um, I don't know that. I am forgetting that guy's name. I meant to look it up at the at the time. He he was an he was a New York. He ended up in New York. He died. I think he died on the subway in New York or something. And but it, it was about being a yuppie or not a yuppie, a, a yippie, a yippie in San Francisco during the Vietnam War. And he, he was involved in like when they used to make soup and garbage cans and, and feed all the hippies. And he, he said that he claims that he invented the peace sign. You know, with your hand. And, I, I uh, just looked it up. I, I, the one upshot of doing these shows remotely is that I can have a browser window open. So oh, I just found the book by a guy named yeah. Emmett Grogan. And, uh, Emmett uh, Grogan, Rindalivia. that's right. And he started yeah. out. He started out somehow. He got into a private school, and he would go to the, the to the apartments, I guess, of his other wealthy schoolmates, and he would like steal stuff out of there. <laughs> so he was and i was just thinking you know that that guy was that guy was a great character and um oh boy i i listen to audiobooks now yeah. and i've been doing that for a long time and mm -hmm. and it becomes easier um when i first started doing it it was hard to focus on the book and like driving or even riding in a car at the same time. Now yeah. it's just wonderful. And, um, I, I just, I consume a lot of them because I'm walking the dog for a couple of hours a day. So I get two hours of just straight story in my head. And right now I am listening to Octavia E. Butler's The Parable of the Sower and then the counter the sequel to that which is the parable of the talents and it's awesome um she started writing this in like the 70s and it is a portrait of what will happen in this country if the republicans and the, the sort of that libertarian weird freedom caucus wing of the republicans gets what they want and it's it's the devastated country um it's it's just tr it's tragic and it it has a great it has a great main character in it and it's it's exactly the kind of post apocalyptic stories that I love I seek them <laughs> out <laughs> every one I can find I will read <laughs> but again you have to figure out how to make it funny for this five pager you're doing so that's that's yeah going to be the oh, challenge oh I, I wrote it I, the story I'm doing I wrote a long time ago oh good okay. um so it's not it's not it's not particularly hilarious like i guess i would i would say but it it i yeah. think it does the trick and it's so they they're yeah. they want it I, so i guess it's okay i I've, I've, I've met joyce i've recorded with her uh god maybe four years ago i, I had a anytime i have a business trip to san diego i book a couple of days in the la area and basically just spend the entire time driving from podcast to podcast. I, I would just get person after person after person and then go to San Diego and have a biotech conference because that's the schizophrenic sort of life I lead. But yeah, I got to sit down with Joyce a couple of years ago. I forget who it was, her, Howard Chaikin, and somebody else within like the same day and a half. Oh, um, amazing. <laughs> it could be a little <laughs> weird. But, you know, you, you change gears pretty quickly for this sort of stuff. But. Do you? Do you keep all these? Re are all these recordings? Oh, every available? one of them is live. They're the, they're all in the archives. You, they're all free. You go to. Wow. Well, I'll send you the, the RSS link. But yeah, you will be episode four hundred and thirty two. I think it's oh, amazing. But what's amazing is uh, a year ago when we were heavy into the pandemic, I was doing this daily with with past guests. I was just having like a half hour with them. And hey, how are you holding up? And how's your pandemic? And it was like very end of March until the early June. 
I look back now and it was 60 episodes in 65 days. And I'm like, I have no idea how I did that and held a job and went through everything else we're all going through. But that was a separate, you know, how we were all trying to cope in that, that first couple of months of, of pandemia, I guess. Well, it's your passion. <laughs> Yeah, it's a weird trip. I try and explain to people that, you know, I'm not doing this for the money. I, I have the day job. This is what I do for love and, and you know, again, ha having good conversations with people. But um, it, it's actually, it's a question I, I meant to ask earlier, and it's out of context now. But when you were talking about other people's drawings of Trots and Bonnie and, and you know, basically how that resembles like your early days because they don't know exactly, you know, the tools – have you, uh, do you remember seeing tattoos of your characters on people? Have you ever um, seen a, a Bonnie tattooed on someone? And did you get really weirded out the first time that happened? No, I think so, someone, well, you know, in the days before email, when my stuff was actually out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think I got a, a letter from someone who, who asked me to design a tattoo. And I thought it was a terrible thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, oh, idiot. I didn't want to promote. Tattoos always a terrible thing to do, regardless of, of the character. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't. Well, I don't have pierced ears, and I don't have any tattoos because I can't make a commitment. But I also, <laughs> I also used to think that having tattoos was terrible because then if you were running from the FBI or something, they would be able to identify you. <laughs> now you realize I can identify you as the one person without tattoos. That's <laughs> Yeah, Paul Mavridis once said that about like all the women he dated couldn't get a, get through a metal detector because they had so many <laughs> <laughs> piercings. Oh God! Yeah. Do you stay in touch with a with with your sordid past? Do you stay in touch with with you know cartoonists from your younger days? Do you have friends? I guess who are still you know, long term. <laughs> Do I have any friends? I only have a few friends. Um, yeah. I. It, you know, it's really hard for me to stay in touch with people. I am like essentially a really bad friend um, mm. because, you know, like I, I don't know whether men have this too. Um, but women, if you're like friends with a, with women, with a woman, I guess it, you'd say um, they it's like it becomes reciprocal. It's like I cook dinner for you and then you cook dinner for me and then we keep doing that. And then pretty soon it's like every week. And then it's mm. like, what happened? You didn't invite me to dinner. Yeah. And I can't, I can't keep that up. I can't keep it up. It's, it's me. And it's not always dinner. You know, it's, it's just the, the re reciprocity of, of friendships and people expect that. So I am friends with people who, um, I tend to, expectations. They, well, they live far away, you know, and we yeah. call each other. And, um, I talk to my friend Becky Wilson, who's a, a cartoonist. Maybe you should talk to her. She's really interesting. She works for the University of Maryland's graphics department now, and she does astrology and politics. She's amazing. Um, so she's good now. friends with Merrick Garland's wife. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, she's she's really – well, she's involved in voting rights and stuff like that. Yeah. When, um, when we're off mic, I'll tell you the story of uh, being behind an escal uh, being on an escalator behind Brett Kavanaugh a couple of years ago. But I'll, oh I'll tell you that one God. off mic, so I don't get, a, I don't yes, get in trouble. Yes, <laughs> you must. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Becky, Becky, and I, Becky speaks my language. She's one of the few people that I talk to that I don't feel like I have to help. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I entirely get that. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe <laughs> that you could phrase it that perfectly. Oh my God. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, and my neighbor, I'm, I'm good friends with my neighbors. My neighbors are really awesome. I, I don't know. I don't know how I came to deserve such smart people to be close what? to me. They're you just, say they're long enough, you know, some of them are going to accumulate around you. <laughs> I get, well, they're not, they're not here because of me, but really, um, super brains, you know, I love people that you can learn stuff from and, uh, and they're just, they're, their experiences are phenomenal. Awesome. Cause yeah, I always wonder 
with artists in particular, whether they have more friends who are artists or non-artists in their lives and, and, and what that says about them, because I, I just live to try to, you know, come up with those weird conclusions. No, I do, I do not seek out cartoonists because here's the thing, because if you're, if you, if you're with cartoonists, you can't write down what they say and then use it in your own work because then it's like stealing. But when you're with like the funniest person, you know, you ever met in your neighborhood who's like pumping gas or something. Well, they don't pump gas anymore. I should say check, checking the grocery checker or something. Uh, I live in one of you, two states that still has no self-serve. New Jersey is still somebody else pumping gas, but you know. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you can, you can steal their, you can steal their jokes. <laughs> well, I asked Emily Flake this a couple of years ago, and she has that wonderful introduction to your your book. But I, I asked know. Emily Flake, I said, Emily, it's it's one thing to like mine your child for material for your comics, <laughs> and have you thought about mining other people's children for for material? Like, if some kid does something really dumb on the playground, do you think, oh my god, I've, I've got to take that? She's like. That's really dodgy territory, but yes, <laughs> no, I've, I've you know, kind of had it surreptitiously writing something down when somebody else's kid does something dumb. But, you know, as long as their parent isn't a cartoonist, I guess. But yeah, it's uh, yeah. she's really good at she's really good at trans translating her life into humor. Yeah. Yeah. She's it's it's. Well, uh, again, I'm in a weird transitional generation, just turned 50. And I've got that the people I idolized when I was younger or the, the cartoonists who meant a lot to me when I was younger, people like you, you know, it's, it's sort of a Mount Rushmore on one side. And I always had a sort of disdain for people younger. And over time I've had the, no, they're like you mentioned with Liana Fink, like there are people who are young, who are really, really good, you know, and it's, it's coming to accept that and not figuring that your time is the golden era, that there's still stuff to be learned from, from other times is, uh, well, it's growing up, I guess, which I'm doing a little bit late in my life, but you know, it's growing. <laughs> <laughs> so sounds like you're doing fine. <laughs> I, I I like to berate myself, but yeah, all things considered, I I, I you know I'm maturing at a, a decent pace. the The last question though that I had for you comes well, it doesn't come from M. K. Brown. It comes from the episode I recorded with her, and it ties into strips you pulled from, from or you didn't want to include in the collection. MK told me she has posthumous comics that she can't publish in her lifetime because they're just they're funny, but they'll they'll be problematic if they actually came out. So they're meant to someday when I'm gone, someone will open this drawer, see these comics and publish them. But it's not going to happen while I'm alive. Do you um, <laughs> do you have things along those lines? Do you have posthumous strips or things that? God, I would publish this, but they'll kill me if I if I actually try to. No, put this in the I, I know what she's talking about too. <laughs> so are they are they good? Because <laughs> she wouldn't show me anything, but she alluded to all this stuff, and I thought mm. that's that's kind of. You know, it's well, probably not. It's probably not what you think it is. Oh, okay. More about the. Uh, uh, it's probably just some. You life. know, I mean, it's like when you're dead, they can't kill you. Yeah. Kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Uh, you know what I what I would and I'm sorry I don't have anything more no, no, interesting to <laughs> say about that but I I wanted to kind of give a shout out to uh Norman Hathaway who is the person who is totally instrumental in putting my book together. Yeah. He got he went he's in New York, he's in Brooklyn and he knew he talked to the guys at New York Review of Comics and said Sherry, you know, this is this is Fantastic! These people are so good, and um, I will, I will do, I will help you put your book together. So, so many people had asked me to do a book in the past, and it's Norman. Norman, I have known since he was seventeen years old, or maybe <laughs> six. Mentioned that in the uh, in yeah, the, in his, in his, and yeah. and he he has just he he. He, I don't know, even he, we used to just hang out and go to restaurants, this little group of us here. And, but he ended up, um, you know, working in sign painting and then he was a designer and then he was living in London and then he was working for Paul McCartney doing design. And now he's doing all these books that are, he's finding things and people who are a little obscure, but are really important in the world of art and design. 
And, you know, he was good enough to, I mean, he really encouraged me to do it. And he's like on me all the time. Like, you got to do a website. You've got to get on Instagram. You've got to do these things. So he's, he is like the energy behind this whole book. And, um, he designed that all the look of the book and everything. That's all Norman. He's so good. The cover was really funny to, yeah. to we hashed out the cover like the we tried so many different colors <laughs> before we arrived at the one we like. <laughs> what was it about it that, that caught you that, that, that you know, why the, did it work I on guess. the cover on the Which cover? Is so difficult? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, there was the images finding the right yeah. image because it's like it's the cover, you know, yeah. And um, first we thought maybe something with dialogue and then we eliminated those. And then it was like, well, this is too violent. This is, you know, <laughs> and the one you've um, chosen and, is that perfect implication of it. But yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And Norman worked on that. He, he tweaked, he tweaked the figures, you know, so that they sit right on there. And also the lettering, the, every single element of that was, like the on the cover was discussed the color of the lettering the style of the lettering and i'm i i sent him like 10 things i like i said well how about these 10 things why don't you pick one of those and he pulled the lettering from one of my strips and and i'm, I'm like i don't know whether that works you know and and then we sat on the on zoom together or something and and went over the lettering and finally arrived back at his choice his first choice. So, and then what is it? The color, he started out wanting it to be pink, I think. And I'm like, no, not pink. Mm -hmm. And he's like, pink is the, the coolest color today. It'll be like really great. And I'm like, I cannot tolerate that. So, and then we got the editors involved, you know, it was just, it was really fun. It was great. Cause it was like marketing, you know? Yeah, I I'd, I'd meant to usually I, I lead off asking about, you know, how the book began, how it all came together. So I apologize for not getting That's that okay. from the very beginning because you can you, you can do anything you want in audition. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I could rejigger this entire shebang. But, yeah. but yeah, I thought his work, the the little note that he writes, plus the the interview that's included and the extra materials, it's it's really such a great physical package of a, a book. This thing, I, I when it showed up, I just. I was giddy. It was about two months ago. I got the review copy. I was like, oh, it's here, you know, and it just, it felt such like a, a yeah. great physical book to have. I was so yeah. happy about it. So. Yeah. That's, that's, that was my response too. I couldn't believe it. It's a great size. It feels great. It's really heavy. Everything's, you know, they, they, New York review of books really worked on the artwork too, to make it, to make it look good. It's better. Duh. It's better. I mean, Lampoon was printing on newsprint, you know. Yeah, that's and why it I don't was feel out of so, register. <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't feel so bad about not grokking how good your line was when I was young, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. Because I'm like, yeah, I don't remember those magazines being printed on like archival paper or anything like that either. You know, it was it was yeah 1980s 1970s print but. yeah i'm i'm doing um i did a series i have like uh uh eight different um book plates um yeah. which i am going to offer to people um if they send me a self-addressed stamped envelope i will send them my signature on my really i love them cute colored book plates awesome. so I will put a link to that, and I will send you a copy of my horrible – well, not horrible – a copy of my first zine, which I put out last year because <gasps> I'm a late bloomer. Um, it, it's it's mainly uh, prose. I'm, I'm working on issue two now, but the weird thing is I've discovered that since I'm doing this drawing, I'm not as, as – uh, I don't have writing mind the way I did. And and there are a couple of essay anecdote things I'd like to write, but there's been a sense of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sublimating that by getting out and drawing a tree. So I'm going to have to balance all that stuff, put a couple of tree drawings in, but there's some essays and other things I want to include in it. Anyway, it's called Haiku for Business Travelers. I'll send you a copy after oh, we, fantastic. we finish it today. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll get your mailing address. But anyway, the question, I guess, which you should really close out is, given how wonderful this book turned out and the experience of putting it together, do you have any regrets about not doing it earlier? Because I, I know you oh, had the, well, I don't really want to go back uh, and, and check out my at book. All. And, not at yeah. all. No, this is really the first time I really would have even had time or the the ability to do it. I just spent five years taking care of uh, someone 
being full-time caregiver to somebody with mm-hmm. Alzheimer's. And before that, I was, you know, making a living, you know, I'm not like you. I, I can't, you know, I can't do that much if I have a day job. <laughs> oh, I, the only way I can do all this is that I have no social life, uh, no kids, and I don't drink or do anything else entertaining. So <laughs> it's just day job, <laughs> this, and now, now trees. But, you know. That's... Well, I, I don't clean house is what, the way I cope with it. I don't clean anything. <laughs> and I read this biography of Shirley Jackson, mm-hmm. and that's what they said about her was that her house was filthy. <laughs> so yeah. I felt better. Nice. You know, again, someday you'll get around to laundry. And and meanwhile, yeah. oh, it's the real last question I forgot, uh, because my dog has been flipped over in cockroach position the entire time we've been doing this this podcast. You mentioned uh, incredibly, well, you mentioned the hours and hours you walk yours. What sort of dog do you have that, that's walking this oh, much? Oh, I've just had him since December, and he is a combination of an English shepherd and a border collie, which means he looks like a really large border collie he's more more rounded than a than your standard border collie and uh his name is teddy and he's he's great he he spent the first four years of his life in eastern washington on a farm Mm -hmm. so he's just getting used to the urban environment now and therefore walking and walking and walking to burn off some of the energy Mm -hmm. Lots of, I walk him, like I'll walk him at 11 o'clock when nobody's out on the street and he just, he doesn't chase balls. So it's really hard to get him to burn off energy, you know, like in the backyard. I have so, the world's laziest greyhound. So, you know, that's, oh. that's. <laughs> oh, well, no, that's the way greyhounds are, I hear. Yeah, he's our third. and he, He's just lazier than the other two were. The other two, they're all couch potatoes, you know, 18 uh-huh. hours a day. Yeah. But the other two would at least walk a couple of miles with us. This guy's like, nah, around the corner's just fine. I'm coming back. You know, oh, he's just wow. <laughs> not interested in the, the hikes we used to take the other guys on. He's just, uh, well, again, he's managed to be flipped over in cockroach position the entire hour and a half that we've been talking. He has not budged. So. Can you can you let him off the leash? Not officially. But um, when we come back into the yard, I will let him go when we're partway in the yard and he'll just take off for the front door like a rocket. Oh, really? Um, yeah, wow. he's agoraphobic, I think. <laughs> he's just got the, I want to be inside, you know. Wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when we, we have friends who also have a greyhound, they have a big fenced in yard and we let the two of them go nuts and, and run around. And that's, uh, you know, as good as that gets. But, you know. They they got all the running out when they were young. He he actually won a couple of races on like our two previous klutzes. But uh, you know he's he's pretty mellow at this point. But uh, lazier than your average greyhound, which is pretty lazy to begin with. So bless your heart for adopting a greyhound. <laughs> oh, they're they're wonderful dogs. I don't know what we're gonna mm-hmm. do now that they're phasing out greyhound racing everywhere, and there won't be you know a lot of these guys out there to get adopted. But. <sighs> You know, my wife's convinced as we get older, we'll start downshifting into like whippets and then Italian greyhounds. You know, they'll, they'll keep getting smaller and smaller for us as we get oh, older yeah. and, and firm. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, we've got a uh, I will send you a link to his Instagram feed because he's, oh, uh, he's a photogenic greyhound. So, you know, anyway, we could talk about pets way too long. But yes. Sherry, I want to thank you so much for the, the time and this book. It brought me back to, uh, again, a weird pubescent gill, but, you know, the, oh, Benny just sneezed in case you heard that in the distance. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, this this book has been a, a blast. And I'm so happy that you, you know, you managed to bring it together and and recreate what I think is a really important comic, especially, you know, again, when people talk about the things that, that meant a lot to them when they were having their minds warped at a young age. Trots and Bonnie is, is tops for me. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you for being so fun to talk to. (laughs) Thank you. And that was Sherry Flanagan. Her new collection, Trots and Bonnie, is out now from New York Review Comics. Like I said, it is an absolute treasure, so I hope you'll give it a read. And as I also hope I got across, the book itself is just such a great book. The design, the the content of it all, just the layout, it's fantastic just to look at. So uh, go get Trots and Bonnie from New York Review Comics.
Now you can follow Sherry on Twitter at Magnolia Bridge and on Instagram at Trots and Bonnie. Her site is SherryFlanagan.com, and that's got a link to her alternate site, SlaveToHerPets.com. I'll have links to all that in the show and episode notes for this one. Um, but you could spell Sherry Flanagan, S-H-A-R-Y-F-L-E-N-N-I-K-E-N. Sherry Flanagan, just like it sounds. Now, you could support the Virtual Memories show by uh, telling other people about it. Um, you can also help by sending me postcards, letters, emails, or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. I don't directly receive those calls, but I get a note saying there's a message. Um, you can only leave up to three minutes per message on that one. However you reach out, tell me what you like and don't like about the show, who you'd like to hear me record with, um, what movie or TV show or book or music or comic or piece of art you, you think I should turn listeners on to or, or just say hello. It's always nice to, to hear from people. I got a great uh, email from a listener in Poland about two weeks ago. Unfortunately, it's really long, and I got it the day after I'd had the second COVID vaccine, so I had this migraine-level headache, and I keep meaning to go back and read it, because I've done the first couple of paragraphs. It's a wonderful email. I've got to finish the whole thing and write to this guy to thank him. So if you're a listener and you're listening in real time, I apologize for not writing you back right away, but I'll get to it. I promise. Anyway, if you've got money to spare, uh, don't give it to me. Do not go to my Patreon um, or or PayPal or whatever. Give to other people. Um, my job treats me just fine. My expenses are still really low for the, the show. Um, other people are in much greater need than I am. So go through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, whatever. Uh, find people who are in need and um, and help them out. If you prefer helping institutions instead of individuals, um, I recommend your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds. Uh, there are a lot of different things you can do to try to help uh, help fix the world. So I hope you will. Also, I still have some copies left of the first issue of my first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. Uh, if you want one, they're free. Just drop me a line or visit Haiku for Business Travelers dot com and you can hit me up through the form there. Um, like I say, free. You can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but really not about my making money. It's just about me sharing my art such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 